Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. And I declare the meeting open to the public.
Members, can I remind you that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online this afternoon. We currently have four members attending the meeting. We've got three members attending in person, myself, Emma Sheeran, Meg Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, and Paula Bradshaw. And we have Mark H. Durkin at the Starleaf. We have now got John O'Dowd via Starleaf as well, and we are expecting Michelle McElveen and Christopher Salford to join us in the room. We don't have any uh, apologies, agenda item one. So I'll move now to the second item on our agenda, which is a briefing this afternoon from the Lord Chief Justice. Um, we're going to receive a briefing from Sir Declan Morgan, who's the Lord Chief Justice for the North. Sir Declan was called to the Bar in 1976 and had a distinguished career as both a junior and senior counsel prior to his appointment as a High Court judge in 2004. And he has served as the Lord Chief Justice since 2009. Members, you'll find a clerk's memo in relation to Sir Declan's briefing this afternoon from page five of your meeting papers. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Lord Chief Justice, together with Andy Kilpatrick, his Principal Private Secretary, to your meeting. <coughs> Declan, you can begin your briefing whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Mandy, can you hear us? Has she gone to get him? Oh. Hey, Mandy, can you hear us? Are we muted? Is that the problem? Okay. We'll take our ease for a wee minute to yeah. sort this out. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. So apologies for the disruption there. We just had some technological issues. But um, Sir Declan, welcome you to the meeting. Mandy, welcome you to the meeting also. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, when you're ready, you can begin your briefing. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't intend to be very long on this, but thank you very much for inviting me along. And the issue, as I understand it, that you want to discuss is that of the justiciability of economic, social and cultural rights. I just want to, um, I know that you've had the benefit of a number of other um, distinguished speakers who've come before um, the committee, and I'm sure that they've been very helpful in explaining much of this to you, and therefore some of what I say is probably um, well uh, known to you. Um, the concept of a Bill of Rights certainly is, um, uh, I mean, it's been established for a very, very long time indeed, in a sense. Magna Carta in 1215 in England 
um, is a classic example of a Bill of Rights. And there was a further example of a Bill of Rights in England in 1689, um, which, depending on your view of things, was about um, deposing uh, a uh, king who was behaving badly or depriving a good king of his um, uh, regnum. Um, we then had another Bill of Rights uh, which arose uh, out of the uh, War of Independence in the United States in 1789. And all three of those you'll see were as a result of major constitutional um, issues arising. One was a dispute between the barons and the king in 1215. One was the dispute over who should be king in 1689. And the other was about the establishment of the um, uh, new uh, United States of America. And all of those uh, bills of rights were focused on civil and political rights. And that remained, I think, uh, largely the theme right into um, the last century. And one sees that the European Convention on Human Rights, which was um, uh, ratified by the United Kingdom in 1950, uh, again is a convention which is um, strictly uh, uh, one based in effect on civil and political rights with the possible exception of the uh, protocol in relation to uh, education. But it was around that time that things started to change in terms of the concept that people had of what a Bill of Rights should contain. And one sees, therefore, um, that in 1949, um, thanks to the uh, work of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights um, was adopted um, then by the United Nations. And they, that declaration included rights such as um, the right to social security in Article 22, the right to work and to free choice of employment in 23, the right to rest and leisure, much sought after right, I have to say, in Article 24, uh, right to a standard of living of adequate for health and well-being in Article 25, education in 26, and the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community and to join the arts, etc., in 27. And those, I think, are very much more uh, in the nature of um, social and cultural um, rights. Um, and the same uh, can be uh, seen in the, um, uh, in the Constitution of India, um, which is, I'm sure many of you will know, is the second longest constitution in the world. And therefore, I'm not going to attempt to um, uh, uh, read out the various rights which are protected there. Um, but the uh, it, it, they did include um, um, some social, cultural, and the Indian Supreme Court, in a sense, um, has developed uh, economic rights out of that. So um, in litigation in the 90s, um, the uh, Indian Supreme Court um, has uh, um, devised out of the right to life a right to health, um, and uh, that remains a matter of some controversy among the jurists, um, in India, um, uh, has also um, uh, expanded um, the concept of the right to housing, um, although uh, I think of some importance in relation to what you're looking at. Whether that's actually made a difference on the ground is, um, I think, uh, a matter of uh, uh, some debate. Um, South Africa is, is another uh, model of um, the involvement of the type of rights we're talking about, economic, social, and cultural rights. So South Africa has a right to housing, including the right to due process with regard to court ordered eviction and demolition, rights to food, water, health care, and social assistance, uh, a, a raft of children's rights, a right to um, education, a right to use language of one's choice, and to participate in the cultural life of one's choice, um, a right of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities to enjoy their culture and practice their religion, use their language, um, um, all of which uh, I think are enhanced by the uh, preamble or recitals um, that accompany uh, the um, uh, Constitution. And of course, there are a series of recitals as well um, that uh, uh, act as a preamble to the United Nations Declaration on uh, Human Rights. Um, some of these, therefore, um, uh, are um, um, assertions of uh, rights which arise on the international plane, that's the United Nations and the 
uh, European Court of Human Rights. Some on the national plane, such as India and South Africa, are as a result of uh, um, constitutional uh, arrangements which are being uh, put in place or amended. Um, and in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom as a whole, um, of course, we have no written constitution, um, but uh, um, such rights uh, can be um, inserted uh, effectively by legislation. And the question is, what impact do they have? Um, so far as the European Convention on Human Rights is concerned, although it is um, uh, characterized at a uh, somewhat high level, um, there is a sustained body of jurisprudence from the European Court um, which assists in the interpretation of what the rights actually deliver. Um, and the uh, establishment of the court to uh, both interpret and develop the rights um, is uh, a, a, an important matter in terms of asserting that these were to be um, justiciable. Um, in the local um, uh, environment, um, uh, perhaps things are not quite so clear. Um, I tried to, to think of some examples of um, uh, what was an indication of justiciability and what wasn't. And, and my example really is the Child Poverty Act of 2010, uh, which has implications for Northern Ireland as well. And it became the subject of some litigation in 2012 because the Act um, provided that within two years, uh, that the level of child poverty um, should be uh, um, reduced. Um, and uh, to do that, it provided various mechanisms, one of which was the establishment of a commission, uh, which was to uh, advise um, the, uh, those who were devising the, the policy that was going to lead to uh, progress. Uh, and there was the commission was never established by uh, the uh, government um, and there were criticisms of the analysis of progress and eventually that came before the courts. Now the courts um, uh, uh, found that failing to establish the commission, which was, if you like, the granular piece uh, that was on the face of the statute, uh, was unlawful. But when it came to the issue of um, uh, the defining of progress in relation to um, um, the, uh, the, uh, the addressing of, of uh, poverty, um, the courts concluded that that was really a matter of political judgment. Um, it wasn't for the courts uh, to seek to intervene in that uh, and that therefore um, the issue was not justiciable. Um, and I think that's a, a feature of uh, what I call target duties. In other words, you have legislation which um, defines in all sorts of way that, that there has to be a health service, that, um, uh, that there has to be an education system, etc. But those are target duties which, although they carry political responsibilities and political implications, um, they, uh, um, they will not uh, um, uh, of themselves uh, provide a justiciable basis because they lack the granularity that um, is a feature uh, of um, what is justiciable. Um, another example in a, in a somewhat different way um, is the uh, protection of victims because uh, as you'll see from uh, some of the instruments which no doubt you've considered that from time to time you will see that the rights of victims are one of the issues which are included in many of these documents which go into the economic, social and uh, cultural rights. Um, but in this jurisdiction, we have uh, uh, have dealt with that, but we've dealt with it in a different way. Um, there is a victim's charter, uh, which uh, I'm sure many of you uh, will be uh, familiar. Um, it sets out extensive rights in relation to victims in terms of um, the information that has to be provided to them, the circumstances in which um, uh, they, uh, their views have to be taken into account, um, the uh, making sure uh, that uh, uh, in relation to decisions to prosecute that there is communication and consideration and explanation um, and various measures to be taken uh, when the case is going to court and at the trial itself. And those are 
um, examples of uh, what a victim could properly complain about in the courts. In other words, the courts uh, would be able to say, well, these are the, um, the steps which the victim is entitled uh, to um, expect uh, if there's been a failure in order to provide them, and then uh, and the courts have to intervene and recognise that uh, for the benefit of the victim. That wouldn't come, I mean, the courts can't make it up if you simply have uh, a, a right for victims within uh, a Bill of Rights or uh, some other um, uh, instrument of that kind. So I think what I'm uh, really saying is that um, um, in looking at this question of justiciability, um, there needs to be um, sufficient granularity, and the courts will also look to see whether um, this is a political rather than um, a legal issue. And I think that should perhaps inform uh, the committee's judgment about um, what it actually wants to do. What is it that uh, a, uh, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland would actually be seeking to achieve? And how would um, uh, the, uh, the legislature um, uh, want to see that held to account, um, either politically or uh, through the courts? How much if you like, um, discretionary judgment, um, do, uh, does the legislature want to put in the hands of the courts and how much political control does the legislature want to reserve um, for itself? Uh, as I said, I, I intended to be brief and I hope that's been helpful to some extent. Chief Justice, thank you very much um, for that and it, it has indeed been helpful. You mentioned there um, that we had received a, a lot of evidence from a, a range of, of different presenters, and I don't know if you caught the evidence session we had a, a number of weeks ago with Professor Chris McCrudden and um, Declan Hanratty. And one of the things that uh, Professor McCrudden was talking about, and he had a, a range of methods or models that he spoke to us about, were the different models that could be employed to prevent um, go governments where a Bill of Rights ha had been applied constantly being dragged in front of the courts and the, the different um, things that you could use. And he, he talked about like the Scottish example of some sort of a pre-legislative scrutiny team or a committee or body that would apply scrutiny to these things to, to, so that it wouldn't get the length of, of JRs. How do you, how do you think um, something like that could be employed to prevent uh, a load of judicial reviews in the event of a, a Bill of Rights being created? Well, um, I mean, I think uh, pre-legislative scrutiny uh, is designed to ensure um, that there is clarity uh, in relation to the provisions, that people know where they stand. And of course, that's uh, um, highly desirable. My own view is that uh, um, you're very lucky if you can predict all of the ways in which these rights can come into play. Um, uh, victims or applicants and uh, their lawyers are clever, inventive people. Um, and uh, um, if there are issues which uh, haven't been picked up, um, th they, they will be uh, pursued by those who uh, seek to get the benefit of them. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, I think if you've got a well-crafted, um, clear uh, um, a document, uh, it certainly can reduce the extent to which um, there is any uh, judicial involvement. Um, but uh, I haven't seen all that many of those, to be honest with you, recently. Okay. Um, to, to ask you about something slightly different, I know yeah. that you have raised some concerns around the Internal Market Bill and your fears around the impact that that could have for the, the general public's relationship with the law in terms of, of the British government stating an intention to, to break international law. You also, in your presentation there, spoke about the fact that a Bill of Rights isn't a new concept and that oftentimes Bills of Rights have arisen out of new constitutional arrangements and when countries maybe were granted or gained independence. Given that we are 
now in the process of leaving the EU and effectively there is constitutional change in Ireland as a result of that because the North will no longer be a, a member state of the EU and there's going to be implications for business owners, for community groups, for individuals um, across the board as a result of that not less in the field of rights and the different rights that people have access to. I've been asking a lot of the presenters that we've had to this committee around how a Bill of Rights could um, address some of the, the rights gaps that we may see as a, as a result of, of leaving Europe and how, how we can address that going forward as this committee, given that the stated intention of this committee is to consider the creation of a Bill of Rights Consider 1998 and considering the impact of Brexit on our particular circumstances? Well, um, I think certainly so far as economic rights are concerned, um, it seems to me that since we don't actually know what the economic outcome is going to be of the uh, arrangements that are ongoing, that it's difficult to make any judgment about that. Um, the, uh, the principal civil and uh, um, um, social uh, or political right, in a sense, that is uh, likely to be affected is the lack of uh, um, access to the Charter of Fundamental Rights if we um, are outside the Union. Um, uh, the, the, it has to be said, however, that um, that will impact in... in uh, I imagine in certain limited ways, having regard to the fact that um, the Human Rights Act still incorporates um, many relevant parts of the um, European Convention on Human Rights, and much of what is contained in the Charter of Fundamental Rights um, has been uh, taken and developed uh, from the uh, um, European Convention. And of course, there is a a uh, strong relationship between the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Court of the uh, European of uh, the European Court of Rights of Human Rights um, in discussion uh, about um, uh, uh, ensuring that there is a common approach uh, to uh, civil and political rights. Um, where there may be, uh, I think, some distinction is that the Charter is um, quite specific in terms of. Um, issues around data protection, um, and uh, uh, it provides, if you like, a degree of granularity in relation to that, which perhaps is not as apparent within the Convention. But uh, I suspect what will happen um, is that just as the Convention is a living instrument that takes into account um, soft international laws such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Beijing Rules in relation to young people, um, and other, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women uh, are, are just some of the examples um, that uh, it is likely that the, um, uh, that the court, uh, the European Court of Human Rights will also, I think, be influenced in its approach to issues around data protection and, and other related matters um, uh, by taking into account in a soft law way um, the uh, jurisprudence developed from the Charter. So I think if that is right, um, then um, so far as those civil and political rights that we enjoy at the moment are concerned, it seems to me that uh, the impact may be limited. I mean, whether that turns out to be right, I mean, who, who knows? Uh, anybody who can predict any of this, I think, is just way ahead of the policy. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I think I can see the force of saying that if we are um, changing uh, our relationship with Europe in a uh, meaningful way, um, that it makes sense to, to take a look uh, and see what uh, the, the pluses and minuses from the point of view of all sorts of rights are. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. I will pass you now to our Vice Chair, Mike Nesbitt. Chair, thank you, Sir Declan. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for engaging with the committee. Much appreciated. It's a great pleasure, Michael. Um, two, two areas, if I may, Sir Declan. The first is with, with, with regard to your view on the public perception of the judiciary, uh, and particularly the independence, impartiality, and integrity of the judiciary if you're being asked to adjudicate on the implementation of a Bill of Rights. Now, I think there's an evidence base uh, that when 
judicial rulings uh, are given with regard to political matters that, that the judiciary takes a hit. And probably the best example is the front cover of the Daily Mail from November 2016 with a headline that screamed, Enemies of the People, referring to the three High Court judges who said Parliament was supreme with regard to, to Article 50. So I'm wondering how likely you think that is and how damaging you would consider it to be to the judiciary. Um, there's no doubt that um, headlines of the type that you uh, um, uh, refer to uh, can be damaging to public confidence. Um, but I suppose my answer to that is that from the uh, standing of the judiciary, it's maybe more important that the judiciary are seen to be able to speak truth to power. Um, and therefore, nobody really disputes now that um, the uh, decision, which was the subject of that headline, was absolutely right, that parliament should be in control and that it's not for the executive uh, to go off uh, and start changing the law on its own. Um, it's maybe just going to take a, uh, a bit of time for everybody to um, uh, recognize that that is the case. But I mean, the judges, um, uh, to some extent, I think, would lose uh, their um, uh, reputation for integrity and independence um, if they uh, weren't prepared to deal with whatever parliament has decided should be put in front of them. I mean, we have had um, a lot of what I would call social issues put in front of, of my court uh, over the last 10 or 11 years when I've been Chief Justice, which I mean, 10, or 10 or 11 years before that would never, ever uh, have, uh, um, have come before us and, and we wouldn't have been asked to deal with them. They, they have made, I think, it uh, difficult for the court from time to time. But I don't think in this jurisdiction anyway um, that uh, uh, there has been a, um, a material uh, impact upon uh, public confidence on the independence and integrity of the judiciary as a result. So it would be fair to say, would it, that, that those sort of headlines, while they're certainly not welcomed by the judiciary, have no actual impact on how you perform your functions? No. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to uh, deal with the cases that come in front of us, um, and we have to apply the law to them. We don't make the law up, um, but we have to apply the law to them. And, you know, the, the, the scope of what we do um, uh, has been changed markedly by the decision of the legislature to introduce the Human Rights Act, and that has caused us to have to deal with a, a raft of uh, um, issues um, that uh, are or were very new uh, once the Act was introduced in 2000. And we've also had to deal with the consequences of these um, uh, awkward issues uh, uh, in Parliament. Um, some of them came before our court um, but uh, and, and then went off to the Supreme Court to get resolved. Um, but, I mean, that's what we're there for. And uh, even though it, uh, it may be difficult, we have to get on with it and, and uh, uh, come out and, and ensure that we give decisions that are in accordance with law, because that, at the end of the day, is what is going to sustain our reputation. Thank you very much, Sir Declan. That takes me to, the, to my second area, which is how comfortable you think you and your colleagues would be adjudicating on a Bill of Rights, because while applying the law, as you said in your previous answer, is really about judging the facts as presented against the statute, if you are being asked to adjudicate on uh, economic and social rights, which may be progressively realized through ministers using maximum resources available, uh, it might be argued that you're not being asked to adjudicate on facts, but on opinions. Uh, and that is perhaps a less comfortable area for you. And if you are doing that, uh, the final part of my question would be, do you think it is, would be best achieved through a specific court, such as a constitutional court, as they have in South Africa? Well, I think, first of all, um, your, your point about... Uh, um, having to deal with particular provisions uh, brings me back to, to my point about granularity. I mean, judges are not there to decide um, how the budget should be split up uh, and uh, how the resources of the um, executive should be applied. 
uh, between competing priorities. That's it's not our function, um, and we shouldn't be uh, asked to do it. And if we're asked to do it, we should decline. Um, and that's what non-justiciability um, is about. Um, and therefore, um, my, my answer to that is that where um, something of that sort was put in front of us, the likelihood is that we would find it non-justiciable because it's a political rather than a judicial matter. Um, your point on the Constitutional Court, I think, is well made. Um, uh, as you know, the um, South African Constitutional Court um, has a range of people from different backgrounds. Uh, you've got academics, you've got uh, people from the community, you've got uh, lawyers. Um, but the idea is that uh, it's a court that represents um, the community. Um, it's not designed to be a court of appeal. It's not designed to be uh, um, strictly um, some kind of interpreter uh, of the law, but it is intended um, to act as a vehicle for um, um, social development. In some areas, for instance, in the United States, the Supreme Court performs that function. Um, in South Africa, um, the Constitutional Court is rather differently crafted, um, and that model is uh, quite common uh, in, uh, in other jurisdictions as well. Um, of course, you then have to figure out what scope um, you're going to give to the Constitutional Court. Um, I can understand that things like the preamble will inform the general approach the Constitutional Court will take. Um, but um, uh, many of these things might have a lifespan. I mean, 20 or 25 years might be entirely sufficient um, for um, the thinking uh, about the need for a Constitutional Court in a society, particularly one uh, which is developing, um, uh, uh, whereas several hundred years might uh, be suitable in other cases. And I think one needs to be careful about that. So Declan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Sir Declan. My question is around the pressures on the court system here in Northern Ireland. We know that they're already under serious pressures, not least with the COVID lockdown. I'm just wondering if you could give us your opinion really on how you feel an expansive Bill of Rights with socioeconomic rights in it, how that would sort of impact in terms of your ability then, even just in terms of workload going forward? Well, I think we'd have to make a, a I mean, I would expect to be consulted on the detail as it emerged, because I think we would have to have an input operationally into what we could manage and, and, and what might require um, additional resource. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow um, that uh, um, uh, th that a, a, a reassertion of, of rights would have that type of impact, but I find it difficult to see um, that uh, um, economic rights are going to be easily made um, justiciable. For instance, if you're looking at things like the right to work, um, the right to housing, the right to health, I mean, of themselves, none of those um, assertions are justiciable. What, what will become justiciable is the um, underpinning of that, because those rights should uh, create political obligations um, rather than um, judicial obligations. And it's those, uh, the, the coming into play of those political obligations that should then uh, form the granularity that would um, uh, make it appropriate for the courts to become involved and in whether or not um, the, uh, the, the substance that was given to the right was actually uh, being um, um, delivered. And that's why you know, in the Child Poverty case, the Poverty Act case, it was the failure to appoint the commission, which was a, a, a granular uh, obligation that, sorry, excuse me, I'll just, um, um, that uh, led to um, uh, the, uh, the court being able to intervene. Um, so, uh, um, uh, I, I mean, I think one, I, I certainly would think it important to bear in mind what the impact on the courts would be. I know that when the Human Rights Act uh, came into force in 2000, that the number of judges in the High Court was increased by two, um, which was about a 25% increase at that stage. So, um, I mean, it was considered uh, that it was likely to give rise to um, a substantial body of work, and indeed it did so. 
thank you. Just to follow on, I think you might have answered it already, but today is Carers' Rights Day, and I suppose the concern I would have um, going back to the Bill of Rights Forum was that we would have raised the expectations for separate sections of society that things would quite quickly improve for them. And my, my husband's a carer, he's a 90-year-old father, so I understand why people here who've got a lot of caring responsibility, the pressure they're under. So how, how do you think that the Bill of Rights could support individual sections of society like carers who are obviously on their knees at the minute? Well, I, I, I think you're right to um, be careful about the expectation that may be generated as a result of um, uh, the uh, establishment of a Bill of Rights. And I think the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that, of itself, um, it, uh, it may indicate a pathway, but um, uh, it, it's unlikely uh, to, um, in any sort of immediate way, in a way, um, uh, provide more than that. I mean, if you look at um, um, some of the... Uh, um, uh, of the, of the, the um, documents which have generated um, uh, 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 litigation in relation to rights, they have evolved over really quite a long period of time. So, I mean, if you take the European Convention on Human Rights, and it was uh, ratified in 1950, it, it really trundled along at quite a modest pace for about 20 or 30 years before it started to pick up. Um, and it was as a result of the pickup that people uh, started to use it from uh, the United Kingdom, and eventually, 50 years later, we put it into law, and it has continued to develop since then. So uh, I, I think there's a, a potential problem here if you, um, uh, if you create a big bang, as it were, about a Bill of Rights which contains what are effectively a series of non-justiciable promises, mm -hmm. and you then don't deliver in terms of providing the granularity within the uh, legislative system uh, to develop and deliver on those rights. And, and I mean, uh, you know, legislation takes a long time um, and it, it requires a great deal of thinking and it will involve uh, um, an issue around the uh, dispensing of the, uh, or the apportionment of the uh, available resources to the executive. So I, I, I would be inclined to, to, to consider all of that very carefully. Thank you, thank you, Chair. No problem, Paula. Um, I don't think any of the other members in the room have questions. Mark, I can see your hand is raised, if you want to ask a question. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair. I wasn't sure if I had, if I had it up or not. Uh, good afternoon, Sir Declan. I hope good you're well. Mark. Uh, Paula there touched on the workload of the court and the impact that a Bill of Rights might have on that. But the head of a Bill of Rights, we're going to have a Brexit. I was just uh, wondering maybe if you could outline, you touched on it a wee bit in the briefing paper that you'd submitted, but what, in, in your opinion, uh, will the impact that Brexit has be on the justiciability and enforcement of rights here? Well, um, as I've indicated, I think the on certainly the civil political rights in a way that the, the uh, feature that, uh, that one potentially may lose is the protections that are given under the Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights and Freedoms uh, uh, within the, which are um, uh, then uh, governed by the Court of Justice of the European Union, and they are the ultimate uh, enforcement authority. And there are various other um, uh, uh, issues that will um, affect uh, uh, much, much stuff in different ways. I mean, I think there's still discussion about the European arrest warrant, for instance, which is a matter of uh, um, um, safety and how uh, uh, it, um, procedures might be put in place to deal with that. And I suspect that what will happen for the courts is that some of these things will give rise to um, problems. Um, people will have different views about how the problem should be solved and the matter will come before the courts. And I think there is an expectation um, that uh, as Brexit comes to pass, um, that the problems will come to the fore um, and that the courts will be um, asked to deal with them. And just before I uh, came on this uh, Zoom call today, uh, I spent um, my second um, lunchtime participating in um, a 
um, sem seminar, which is not going to run now over six days, uh, run by the um, uh, the um, uh, uh, Council of uh, uh, European Law in uh, in uh, Ireland, but uh, this was actually chaired by uh, Queens, where uh, we're actually looking at all of these things to see where the um, uh, the problems are likely to lie. But for the reasons I've given, it doesn't necessarily follow um, that um, civil and political rights are going to be materially uh, impacted um, if, in fact, uh, um, one, the convention, the European Convention stays in place, and secondly, that convention law basically marches in pace uh, with the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Okay, thank you, Declan. Thank you. Mark. John, do you have anything you want to ask? Uh, good afternoon, Sir Declan. Thank you. Good for afternoon, your John. Presentation and evidence thus far. Um, you, you'll only be too acutely aware that uh, government departments and indeed statutory agencies, etc., are already governed by a very uh, lengthy statute book, uh, which leaves them open to judicial review. Uh, and as you've already said, a, a number of socioeconomic issues has appeared before the courts in recent times. And I suspect that's as much to do with the executive and, and the assembly we have in functioning as it has to do with anything else. But would you agree that if government departments and others adhere to a proposed Bill of Rights as they do, as they have to adhere to the other statutory legislation, then the work of the courts will be lessened? So there's always the prospect, and as there should be, of a judicial challenge. Um, well, I, I think I put it slightly differently. That may be right, um, but uh, I suppose the, the question mark I would have in my head is whether or not um, the uh, production of an enhanced uh, or apparently enhanced uh, series of protections will uh, create expectations which it might prove to be difficult to deliver. And I think the, the, uh, the, the boundaries of what any Bill of Rights uh, might offer will, will undoubtedly be tested, at least in the initial stages, to see to what extent the courts uh, can assist in relation to both its interpretation and uh, the appropriate uh, application, and indeed the scope uh, of uh, what we as the courts um, um, should actually um, be looking at and what is a political matter for yourselves to sort out. So I think there's always going to be, at the initial stage, a, a process of testing. Um, once that's over, it may be uh, that everybody will know uh, where they stand, um, that uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to get rid of the judge over your shoulder, as they used to say in the 1980s, um, and that uh, the systems will bed down. Um, but, I mean, if that happens, it happens. We'll certainly, uh, um, uh, if we need to get additional resource to do it, we'll make the case for that. Um, and if we find we can do it within our existing resource, then we'll do it. Thank you. I'm working on the basis that if we do get to the stage of a Bill of Rights, uh, the judicial challenge will come through a JR. Yeah. And it has been suggested and indeed uh, discussed in other areas that our bar for accessing a judicial review is lesser than other parts of these islands. Would that be something you suggest we should look at? Well, I, I, I don't believe that there is a, dis, a distinction. I mean, I think we have a, um, a, a leave test, which follows broadly in principle the same uh, as, as is the case in other parts of the, uh, of the United Kingdom and indeed in the Republic of Ireland. So. I think the notion that uh, judicial review is um, um, more easily achieved here in terms of a hearing, uh, I don't think is, is supported by the evidence. I mean, we actually have, I think, somewhere around 350 to 400 judicial reviews a year. It's not a colossal um, a number. Um, it does require uh, at least one judge to be um, um, uh, involved. Um, and I suppose it can get a lift um, uh, when there are no other avenues for people to go to. Um, and, of course, that was the problem where uh, the executive wasn't sitting and there were uh, a number of cases that we had to deal with during that time um, on issues which the executive themselves or the assembly themselves might well have sorted out for us without us having to do it. 
Um, but um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't believe there is evidence that um, there's something, as it were, awry about the way in which this review is available in this jurisdiction. Okay, and that's 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 an interesting contribution, I think, and, and obviously a very informative uh, contribution uh, to to that debate. In, in regards, then, would you envisage a role for a dispute resolution mechanism, a mediation mechanism, which perhaps would uh, not require then full court hearings? It, it, is that something yeah. that's useful in this, in this arena? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do this quite regularly um, uh, in that we we quite often, in a judicial review, you try to get the papers at an early stage um, and then take a look. The first thing you look to see is whether or not it looks like uh, an issue uh, that could benefit from um, some form of um, formal or informal um, um, attempt to resolve it. By the parties, um, and we, you know, really quite regularly, the cases never come to uh, fruition because we're able to um, give a bit of encouragement. Um, we don't quite act as mediators, but we certainly would send people off with a, a suggestion, perhaps, as to how they might start to approach it. Um, and we, um, I think, are reasonably successful. Uh, in uh, resolving a lot of these cases by agreement, which of course always means that there's much more likelihood of the results standing, because if people have agreed the outcome, then there's much less likelihood of trouble down the line, as it were, uh, if somebody doesn't like the judicial decision. Okay, and finally from myself, um, in terms of where a Bill of Rights should be legislated for, uh, does it require Westminster in terms of the, the wide gambit of treaties and agreements that we will be uh, involving, does that require Westminster legislation in your view? Um, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, uh, I didn't think uh, you would. If it eventually comes to me, I'll write a judgment about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Declan, for joining us, and uh, Mandy as well. And thanks for your patience throughout our, our hiccups at the, at the start of the meeting. Right. Thank, All right. thanks well, very much. Thank, thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Members, um, item three on our agenda is chairperson's business, and we don't have any. Um, item number four is the draft minutes. Are members content to uh, agree the minutes of the last content. meeting? Happy days. Item number five, we don't have anything in the matters you're raising. Um, we then have correspondence. Um, if members are content to note that, I uh, see that we have a letter in there from the Equality Coalition um, in relation to some things we were talking about last week around the, the use of the, the veto in terms of the restrictions. People are happy to note that. Item number seven, forward work programme. And that takes us up to Christmas. Yes, anyone has any other business? No, no. Nope. Just, uh, so, sorry, Chair, one thing that was in terms of the public consultation, have there been early, any early indications of uptake or interest in that? I was going to ask, Chair, can you, do, do you have a means of measuring yeah. that? Um, yes, Chair, we can check in on the survey responses any time. So we've had a good few hundred responses so far. Um, which is a great start, um, given it's quite a long period for this. Um, I would encourage all members to promote this and um, to your constituencies as well, as to encourage a good spread and a good um, sort of balance across the community of participants. Um, and we're also engaging with um, civil society at the moment, trying to work out how we may engage further with um, stakeholder events potentially uh, in the new year as well. Okay, super. All right, Mark. Brilliant. Um, so if no one has any other business, the date, time, place of next meeting is the same time next week in the same room. I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern